All right. Well, uh, we're small but mighty here. We might have some of our uh, some of our other folks kind of join us here in a bit, but. You know, this is the marketplace track on the final afternoon of Envision B2B here. And we put this track together for a big reason, which is a lot of folks have a lot of questions about how to make a marketplace strategy, no matter what your walk of life is, kind of work for you. So we intend to kind of unpack some, uh, some issues here this afternoon. And beginning with one top of mind here, which is how do you begin to move out on any kind of marketplace you deem sufficient for your organization in the right way. So we have some folks here that are going to talk about that. We have Jeff McRitchie and Adam Thibodeau. And why don't you gentlemen introduce, introduce yourselves? Go first. Sure. Good. So um, my background comes uh, from the office products world, uh, where I co-founded a B2B2C um, a company uh, that sold binding and laminating. Uh, grew that for 15 years, uh, sold it to private equity, and spent the next couple of years um, uh, sort of running e-commerce for the larger organization and the multi-brands that they had. Um, and uh, super fun journey. I, I most recently just made a pivot where I've actually um, moved into a president CEO role of a manufacturer in Seattle. So I'm um, uh, looking at figuring out how to take them digital. Cool. Um, my name is Alan Thibodeau. I work for a company called McFadden Digital. Uh, we actually help uh, our, our customers, our clients, establish themselves as a marketplace and actually become a operator within, uh, you know, with actual sellers as a marketplace. So uh, I think I'm going to, um, my goal today is actually to, to bring the perspective of the operator uh, of a marketplace, uh, even though we're kind of talking about sellers, of just saying, hey, this is what an operator would expect, or at least this is what we would advise an operator to expect out of its sellers. Well, we're starting with pricing for a reason, only because it tends to be kind of a bellwether challenge issue, uh, opportunity to kind of conquer right from the get-go. I mean, you talk with uh, operators or practitioners or, or you know, uh, sellers and buyers of any sort, and the price point. How do you put something on a marketplace where maybe, I mean, for instance, Amazon business, you know, <clears throat> people have bellwether opinions, that's, my, that's my, my word for this afternoon, on Amazon business. Good for you, bad for you, someplace in between. You know, you're paying for that traffic, and you're paying a heavy premium sometimes for that, that traffic. So a common complaint we hear from very small individuals when we talk to them about, hey, what's up with marketplace challenges has to do with, well, you know, I, I get the exposure, I get more top line order, but guess what? I don't get the margin on them. So that affects my thinking. So that is why we kind of put together, you know, this panel on on how do you price these things without, uh, without you know, making it unworth your while. So our first question is, how can organizations decide which products they should sell via marketplaces versus keeping exclusive to your own site? And when do you know the mix is right or the time to shape things up? All right. Um, I, I think the, the key thing here is, is and what we would advise is that you want to be as in, involved in as many channels as possible. You have an opportunity to, to sell your goods um, in any channel, sell it, um, as long as it's in line with your brand. Some you know, luxury brand manufacturers may not want to be on, on every marketplace out there. As long as it's appropriate and you can, you can sell through a channel, it's, it's great to do it. Uh, now, it's, I think part of that other part of the question was your product mix, and understanding your product mix is is really about constantly testing. I don't think you ever really uh, have things perfect because um, things change, right? Uh, markets change, uh, desires and needs change uh, from consumers, and so you always want to be testing, you always want to be learning, um, and don't let your product mix grow stale. All right, Jeff, what do you think? So I would sort of disagree. Um, oh, I, I think that there's right. conflict. conflict. Uh, yeah, I love like it. That, um, <clears throat> I mean, if if we kind of like rephrase the question, like to think about it from a more traditional standpoint, should you sell your product to Walmart, right? Um, so you got a couple of things to consider. One, does it reflect who you are um, and who you how your customers see you? That's the brand thing you brought that up. So I agree with that. But then also, um, can you make money there? How does it affect your perception across the, the entire industry? And pricing is a big part of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you have control? 
right? Um, some marketplaces give you control and some really don't, right? Um, and, uh, and can you control your distribution channels? Um, meaning like moving forward, does this choice that you make today, what's the impact of that moving or like down the road? And there's a bunch of them, right? Like especially, mm -hmm. mostly it's with Amazon, but there, it's not, Amazon's not the only one. Yeah. Sometimes you make this choice and you don't realize you're signing up for something that maybe you didn't really know you're getting into, right? And so I think like walking into it with, you know, your eyes open, understanding what you're signing up for and what the potential repercussions of it could be um, before you, you, you get into a marketplace is really important. Sure, uh, I would actually say we, we agree more than okay. we may think because um, I think one of the, the questions that, that's coming up is, is uh, ask you about, um, you know, deciding uh, which marketplaces to, to, to uh, participate in. And I think the key thing there is understanding the policies of of your of the marketplaces that you're going into and optimizing based on on policies, right? Cool. Because that's a behavior that they're trying to 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 create, and if you, that behavior is in line with what you want to do, then great. If not, right. then then maybe it's not the right place for you. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you you know to kind of just I mean the real core basic question though is how do you determine kind of pricing tied to product mix going in? As a case in point, I. You know, I was talking to, I was at Spike, I was speaking at a show a few years ago, and this very same topic came up. And in that case, I talked to three manufacturers, I think, that were, they, they were they, you know, one guy was testing dis, discontinued product lines, and that was a good way to excess, you know, re, get rid of excess inventory. Another person, they were just trying one line to, just to see if they were going to like it or not, but more or less what they wanted to kind of learn was, they wanted to kind of, they were, I think they were just, coming on board with Amazon Business, they wanted to kind of put one line up there to kind of learn the ins and outs of more of were they a competitive threat versus you know, a sales op for them. So my point is the reasoning for why companies of all sizes come onto a marketplace and their pricing strategy tends to be coming from a lot of different reasoning here. But you know, what's some common ground here? What are some things to look out for, to avoid, or, or on the other side do if you want to make sure that the product mix you choose to sell is at the right price point that's good for you, and that's just more overhead for you know the marketplace or somebody else. You want to take this first? Sure. I, I, I can at least start. <laughs> so, um, so to me, this is not necessarily just a marketplace's question. It is about how you control um, the distribution of your products to the world and how you control or influence the way that they're priced. And control is a tough word because we know that there's like, you know, any competition laws and, and we, we, you run the, you run, run risks. Um, but if you think about it, so, um, and, and recognize that different marketplaces behave differently. A Amazon is kind of the bear out there and think about it like, and something to remember is Amazon is on a mission to drive prices down. If you look and if you haven't like sort of dug into their flywheel, take a look at their flywheel and you look at it, their entire thing is drive the prices down to get more customers so that you can drive the prices down more to get more customers and just goes around and around and around. And so if you think about it, looking at this and saying, hey, so I know that that's the case. So how, but how does that fit into the, the entire picture? So it's not marketplaces in, 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 a, in a vacuum. It's like, okay, how is this going to compare to the way that it's presented on uh, through my distributors and through my dealers, through my sales channel, and it has to be fit into that larger picture. Otherwise, what you end up with is is an outlier, and those outliers, the customers know how to manipulate or or um, uh, uh, you know sort of find the holes in your distribution strategy. But worse than that, the marketplaces also understand that they need to fit somewhere into that distribution strategy, and they're going to try to to use the the inconsistencies in your distribution strategy as well against you. And so I, I think it's it's not in a, in a vacuum. You don't look at a marketplace and say, oh, I wonder how I can control prices there. You have to look and say, how am I going to control prices or influence prices across my entire distribution channel? And, uh, and by doing that, um, you can make sure that you don't end up with one place that shows it at half the price of another place, yeah. right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so you need a, a pricing strategy across all of your market, uh, marketplaces or any channel that you're participating in, including your direct uh, relationships with your with your customers, right? Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, we're not exactly the hugest crowd here today, so keep in mind, I've been saying this for two and a half days now, 
this is your session, this is your conference, so if you guys want to jump in with a question or two, or three, or four, or five, let us know, and we'll, we'll, and we'll kind of pivot and talk to that just a little bit. So, by, but don't be bumping along, my friends. Be interactive here if you want to kind of talk to these guys. So, uh, before I leave this whole price, this price, uh, uh, King setting, setting prices kind of thing, you know, there's an interesting uh, dichotomy emerging as this digital stuff takes more and more hold. And one of the things which is traditionally, you know, with a lot of mainstream dis distribution companies, even manufacturers, it's always login. You know, yeah, here's my public facing website, here's some products for you, but if you want to get to the good stuff, the catalog, you know, do the account lock-in, do, 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 do the login stuff, and it'll take in. Then you'll see, you know, my prices for you, and then you'll see how to, how to source it, how to do all that. So that's traditionally how e-commerce behind the firewall and B2B has worked. Now with marketplaces, they tend to be more of an open, transparent type of apparatus, if you want to put it that way. Not that everyone is, but that's kind of, you know, where the medium lies, I would think. So, there are more and more digital first buyers out there that are kind of self-serve, and they don't want to predict the deal with a firewall every single time. They want pricing transparency. So, yeah. you know, there's that. We'll see who wins. You know, do, do business buyers win because they want more transparency, or does, you know, the, uh, the, the, the current pricing models behind the firewall hold for quite some time? That's a long version, I know. My core question is, marketplaces are this new dynamic, kind of changing a lot of things. So, will they change the pricing dynamic for more transparency for all things B2B pricing and not just on the marketplace? I say absolutely yes. In fact, uh, we, have, we have a customer uh, working with us uh, that is, uh, that is their entire goal is to bring price, pricing compare, uh, Price, price transparency to their industry. Um, so it's the chemicals industry, and, and in one case you've got, um, one chemical could be sold for five bucks to one industry, but maybe it's sold for $500 to the health and wellness industry, right? Because uh, there's just a difference or of use between those two different uh, industries, and they're able to charge a premium for it in, in the health and, and wellness industry. Well, bringing price transparency brings a lot of disruption to the industry. Uh, so, having um, you know, having the ability to to uh, be trans that that is one of the main goals of many marketplaces is to drive that transparency. So then it circles back to what Jeff was saying. So if you're a seller in those type of situations where tr uh, price transparency is actually disrupting your your industry. Um, you've got to have a you got to have your pricing strategy kind of ready to go on how do you handle I think there's really two different levels of it it's it is how do you handle your your pricing with behind your wall garden with your customers and then how do you handle it with the transparency that are the, that you get when you're dealing with marketplace because you still are going to have many b2b uh, companies are still going to have their negotiated pricing with yeah. their with There's their no one size fits all. Right. So so you have to have a strategy for how you're dealing with your customers here, but understanding that you're being transparent in the market and they're going to be able to pick up on, hey, well, you're selling this here or selling this there. Um, I'll make one other point. Um, <clears throat> Mike from Base Supply made this point um, yesterday, which was, <laughs> hey, Mike. Um, uh, is is that uh, he was he was talking about the uh, uh, about the price transparency, uh, but participating in marketplaces. Not only does base supply aren't not only are they a marketplace, but they participate in marketplaces. And so, it, and what they have found that that sometimes a customer will buy uh, by picking up the phone. Sometimes they'll buy directly online. Sometimes they'll buy from one of the market uh, one of the market marketplace buys. But it's all about finding that, uh, you know, sometimes it's all about what is convenient to the customer uh, at that point in time. Jeff, what do you think? So I agree, although it's not always about convenience, right? Sometimes yeah. it's about price. Yeah. So like, uh, 
if, if you have a hole or a discrepancy in your pricing plan, for instance, it's free shipping on Amazon, but it's you charge shipping from yours, you'll have a group of customers that say, well, I can get it on Amazon, they'll guarantee the quality, um, and uh, I'll get free shipping, so I'll order from there. And you'll pay 15% premium to Amazon for the privilege of taking their order, right? Yeah. So um, so there is a challenge. Uh, what I found on one on one side, uh, from the, the, the seller's standpoint, is, is that um, whatever your lowest price is, or sorry, uh, what, if you've got a whole bunch of custom B2B pricing out there, you can't put a price out that's lower than your highest price that you're putting to your customers, right. um, unless you have a, uh, like a, a wish to piss a lot of people <laughs> off, right? <laughs> so, um, so if you think about it, if you're charging this guy 500 bucks and you decide I'm going to go, go ahead and put it out in, out to the world at 300. You're, you're basically just playing this really dangerous game that I hope he doesn't see. And, and I'm gonna tell you, like, that's a really bad game. So um, I, I think that at, at that point, I think this, you know, to me, then you're talking about a strategy. You have to come up with a strategy that says, am I bringing a different product to market in marketplaces so that there's not a direct comparison? Because the, the marketplaces, they want you to play the transparency game. But as a seller, you don't have to play their game. You can play your own game, which says, you know what? Like, I, I don't, I want transparency, but uh, there's got to be some magic in here that allows us to make margin, right? Like, if, if we all agreed to do transparency, then all the chemical companies would get together and we say, okay, this is the same as this, this is the same as this, and we'll all just drive the price down to the to lowest common denominator. But they don't do that; they put their own special name on it, and all of a sudden, you're like, well, is that the same? I don't know, <laughs> right? And, and all of a sudden, yeah, right. so and, and and sometimes someone will say, "Well, I'll pay twice as much for this one because it's a better quality." It's the exact same thing, right? right? So, so part of it is on the seller to say, "How are we going to differentiate? How are we how are we going to play the game against the marketplaces, right?" And say, like, if we're going to play, let's play, right? You know, but let's play in a way that we can control our margins and um, and get the maximum amount of price possible. It's like Game of Thrones, man. It's it very much is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there, there are a lot of things that, I mean, understood, you know, that the, still to this day, the core focus of marketplace is to bring buyers and sellers together. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what, you know, what the, I mean, that's the baseline trend, of course. But increasingly, you know, digital buyers want sophistication. And increasingly, all the marketplaces, we had a couple of them here between Mike and Lugo and a few mm -hmm. others. Uh, they're adding more and more features. So there's now a lot of things being added to a marketplace tool set that helps in price influence. One of those is content. So more content, not less. Uh, product specs for one, you know, maybe reviews for two. I mean, the uh, litany of what the information is to be the cheap price influencer. So the core question we're gonna ask next here is what kind of content can an organization provide that goes beyond saying, here's the rock bottom price and what we're offering here in a picture of it, and maybe a couple of skew, uh, you know, skew, uh, skew uh, uh, bullets. What role does content play in pricing on a marketplace? How much is too much? What's not enough? I don't know, you, know, you tell me. Buyers want content, and they want it on a marketplace too, so how much does that influence pricing is my point, my question. So, I mean, uh, the, the, the most non-intuitive insight that you can take away from this, that, that question is, is that the most important piece of content that you can put up is the title. Um, and it's, it's not intuitive because you look and say, oh, I need to add all of this stuff. That's way below the fold. Lots of people don't even read it. So you, but you have this control over this title to say, I can call it whatever I want. And by ch changing the way that you title your product, you change the way that it's perceived to be priced um, by the customer and their ability to directly compare it against other products that might be similar in the marketplace that would, would control your price. So I think that on one hand, you can add a ton of content below, like whether you're talking about enhanced brand content on, on your Amazon listings, that's going to drive your, your conversion rate up. It potentially allows you to position your product as a as a premium product, which allows it to be priced competitively against other products that are similar in the same space. But if you have comp competition, um, that competition will continue to drive the price down. Um, your your goal on marketplaces needs to be to eliminate competition, 
Um, if you if you allow the competition to to run fierce, you essentially um, are playing the game of allowing the price to be driven down. So uh, so I would say that your content needs to figure out a way to differentiate your product in such a way that it it, um, it not only stands out from your competitive products, but more specifically that it makes it so that um, it's not quite as easy for someone to say widget A is the same as widget B, and I can get this one for. 25 cents less, and I'll just go with that. Yeah. You know, part of the fun of my job is like, I get to put people on the spot. Like, <laughs> you know, Mike, uh, Mike from Day Fasting is here, and, uh, you know, I think you folks work with him, but Mike, can you share just a little perspective? Because, you know, you folks have been doing fasteners for a long time now, and your marketplace is all about fasteners, but could you just talk a little bit about, if you wouldn't mind, what are you seeing with pricing dynamics on the marketplace you folks just launched? I'm kind of, I'm kind of curious to hear from the, the trenches on that, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I think, um, I think there's a, there's a what you're, when you're talking about price competitiveness, there, you have to look at industry sectors too. You know, a commoditized industry is going to be uh, maybe more price sensitive. But in the faster industry, while we have commodities, we, we also have availability, supply, demand, that is always being a challenge. And it's not like retail where it became more like a, a, um, uh, a fight to the bottom, right? In, in right now in B2B, uh, pricing in, market, in marketplace or pricing in B2B is really number seven on the priority list, right? If you look at it, 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 it comes into play, but what's more important is convenience, uh, job uh, to, to get the job done, right? So people are trying to get their job done. The faster they can do it, the more efficient they can do it, then, then, then that's what they're looking for. So we would see customers that won't log in to get their discount price because they're not paying the bill. They just want to get their job done. So we'd say, hey, why, why don't you log in to get access to your contract pricing? Ah, I don't care. They'll buy from Amazon for more money, but it's where they are at the time for convenience. Now pricing comes into play, but I don't think we're there in B2B. I think in B2B right now, we're talking about disruption. We're talking about taking uh, antiquated systems and turning them into processes, and pricing will come into play later as, as more of a higher priority on the list. But right now, B2B has an advantage, I think. Hey, Luke. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, have a little fun here. We have a we have Luke Powers, who's also the CEO of Workflow, you know, another marketplace operator. So, would you mind just, uh, yeah. just from your observation, what are you seeing with pricing dynamics on your marketplace? Yeah, sure, I can get. I mean, what's moving the needle? Kind of what's, uh, you know, what's, uh, what's not? What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. It goes on along. I think um, so. Convenient. So uh, I should back up. So Gearflow is a company name. We're a B two B marketplace for construction equipment parts. So think, you know, if you imagine a skid steer, if you imagine a job site, all the equipment on the job site. <laughs> So on the supply side, there's um, the manufacturers themselves, the dealer channels, as, and as well as aftermarket part suppliers. Buyer side, mostly equipment owners, contractors, or even rental companies. Um, but the economics on the line, so when we think convenience, I think as a consumer, um, we're like, oh man, Amazon's great because I get my toilet paper the next day and I don't have to go to Kroger. Um, but the economics in our industry, um, con convenience doesn't, it, it is 100% right because of the um, economics at stake. So Scanska, who's one of the top uh, contractors in, in the world, tells their former it costs the company $90,000 per day of machine is down. So like, to your point on not logging in to see pricing, $90,000 is on the line because your labor's down. So I need that part as quick as I can. And that's where we've, we've been able to, to grow, is, try, is solving that downtime pain in our industry. Um, but yeah, so that kind of goes along the same lines as convenience, but it's there's economic, there's way bigger economics than saving 50 bucks on the Right. Now the only thing marketplaces have in common is the name marketplaces, right? I mean these things come in all shapes and sizes. And you know, I I mean, you know, Paul and I talk with with uh, I mean this is a hot button issue, this whole marketplace thing. So we have a whole track on this afternoon. But people are very curious because they have all kinds of questions about marketplaces, one of which is which model or models work best for me? And as we just mentioned, they come in all shapes and sizes. Now, dialing this back to our pricing discussion, I wouldn't think that one size fits all for you know, what you would put on you know, Alibaba versus Amazon versus, say, a vertical like these guys operate. But I don't know, you guys tell me. So 
How dynamic does pricing have to be depending upon the marketplace model or models that your organization may choose to try and, uh, you know, try and uh, optimize? I thought you were going to end that a little bit differently with your question, no, but I, I, <laughs> you're going down one path. But yeah. I, actually, I would like to, to kind of key on the first part of that, if you don't mind. Um, because uh, we've been building marketplaces for 15 years. We just weren't calling them marketplaces. Yeah. Um, and uh, But one of the key things that we have learned is, is when, when marketplaces has gotten very popular for uh, companies like uh, a base applied to, to do something like that. You know, it's been really over the last five years, right? It's really kind of caught on, right? But the, the key the key thing there, though, is, that we're finding is that we're out there trying to educate the, the market about how marketplaces work. And, and the big panacea that, that, that gets sold is you get like thousands of, of sellers and and there's there's a, it's going to bring thousands of buyers and everybody's going to make millions of dollars, right? That's the, the the big grand vision. But what we're really discovering is is that between just selling your one P products and selling uh, and, and having that grand vision, there's actually a lot of companies that fit in the middle much better, right? Uh, some of them are just trying to bring in a, a curated set of of uh, sellers and products. Some of them are uh, really just trying to learn, and then ultimately they decide to just do drop ship. So, what it, what what I want to really get at is it's really about understanding your business objectives. What are you trying to accomplish? Understanding kind of the 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 whole range of things that you could do. One of the things that we really have to focus on is what are your business and technical objectives that you're trying to accomplish, and then you then you select the right technology uh, and, or the right business uh, uh, model for yourself. Some of it may be a, a little bit of curated sellers, some of it might be drop ship, but it could be a, a mixture of, of all of those. So what do you think? I mean, the, the, the core question really is, can you price the same over a variety of marketplace models or does each one have to be different? And if so, how do you determine the strategy to make sure that you're selling the best one, the best price point on whatever model you choose? So, um, again, there's a, a bunch of different pieces that go into this. So there's a, this amp, there's, there's this like, you know, what, a thousand pound gorilla in the room, which is Amazon. And, um, and it, it plays by a different set of rules than almost all the other marketplaces that we're talking about here. Um, and it, it, it does change the dynamic if you choose to play in that arena. So like if we say, okay, let's take Amazon off the table for a second and say, okay, um, but the, the balance is, is this. So Amazon gives you access to millions upon millions of additional potential customers that you may or may not have access to today. Other marketplaces have much, much smaller, but sometimes curated audiences. If you want to make your own marketplace, you certainly can. It's the ultimate control. So on a spectrum of control, you have very little control in the Amazon world, right. and ultimate control in your own marketplace. But um, in terms of audience, you have virtually an unlimited audience versus maybe an audience of zero to start when you make your own marketplace. So the, the thing is, is on, a, on a sense of you're giving up control in order to gain exposure. Um, the level of where you sit, like I agree, like people don't fit, fit in one place on the spectrum. Can you price the same across all of, the, all of those things? Ideally, if they're public, because um, any time that you, you price differently across different channels, you run the risk that your customers figure out, hey, that's different. Although, again, there are strategies that are out there to, to get around that. You just call it something different on the different marketplaces. And then it, it becomes difficult for people to say, go to, a, go, to, go to business as a different brand on the other marketplaces. Like, there's a, a bunch of different ways of, of sort of approaching that problem. But I don't know that you can say, hey, I'm going to call it the exact same thing, put it out there at 12 different price points, and maintain some sort of integrity with your customer. Um, and because the worst thing that you want to have is you, it's your million dollar customer who figures out that they're, they're getting a bad deal. And then they decide that that may be the trigger that calls, causes them to call your competitor. And so it's not about the 50 cents on that one single item. It's like, wait a second, why, why does, like, 
Joe who's never bought from this person before get a better price than I do? And, and if you have been doing this long enough, you've probably made that mistake in some way or fashion, right? Like, uh, you know, we've, we've all done it. Like, how did that happen? Well, some intern that we hired put the price down on the marketplace to sell some more, and then your best customer gives you a call and says, well, what's up? Right, um, you know, so uh, I, I think it's a balance. Um, but I don't know that you can find a way to publicly price cheaper than your best customers get um, and, uh, and, and sort of maintain integrity for long term. All right. Well, please thank Jeff and Adam. All right. Thank you.